Tragedy and Hope A History of the World in Our Time by Carol Quigley Chapter 12 Circles and Counter Circles 1935 to 1939 Laval's agreement of January 1935 with Mussolini had been intended to bring Italy to the side of France in the face of Germany, a goal which seemed perfectly possible in the light of Mussolini's veto on Hitler's coup in Austria in July 1934. This result would have been achieved if Ethiopia could have been taken by Italy without league action. In that case, Mussolini argued, Africa would have been removed from the sphere of league action as North America had been in 1919 by the Monroe Doctrine Amendment to the Covenant, and Asia had been in 1931 by the failure to take action against Japan. This would have left the League as a purely European organization, according to Mussolini. This view was regarded with favor in France, where the chief, if not the sole, role of the League was to provide security against Germany. This view was completely unacceptable to Britain, which wanted no exclusively European political organization and could not join one herself because of her imperial obligations and her preference for an Atlantic organization, including the Dominions and the United States. Thus, Britain insisted on sanctions against Italy. But the British government never wanted collective security to be a success. As a result, the French desire for no sanctions combined with the British desire for ineffective sanctions to provide ineffective sanctions. Because there were sanctions, France lost Italian support against Germany. Because they were ineffective, France lost the League system of collective security against Germany as well. Thus, France had neither bread nor cake. Worse than that, the Italian involvement in Africa withdrew Italian political power from Central Europe and thus removed the chief force ready to resist the German penetration of Austria. Still worse, the hubbub of the Ethiopian crisis gave Hitler an opportunity to declare the rearmament of Germany and the re-establishment of the German Air Force in March 1935 and to remilitarize the Rhineland on March 7, 1936. The remilitarization of the Rhineland in violation of the Versailles Treaty and the Locarno Pax was the most important result of the Ethiopian crisis and the most important event of the period of appeasement. It greatly reduced France's own security and reduced even more the security of France's allies to the east of Germany because, once this zone was fortified, it could decrease greatly France's ability to come to the aid of Eastern Europe. The remilitarization of the Rhineland was the essential military prerequisite for any movement of Germany eastward against Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, or the Soviet Union. That such a movement was the chief aim of Hitler's policy had been clearly and explicitly stated by him throughout his public life. German rearmament had proceeded so slowly that Germany had only 25 paper divisions in 1936 and the German generals demanded and obtained written orders to retreat if France made any move to invade the Rhineland. No such move was made, although Germany had less than 30,000 troops in the area. This failure arose from a combination of two factors. One, the expense of a French mobilization, which would have required the devaluation of the franc at a time when France was working with desperate energy to preserve the value of the franc. And two, the objections of Britain, which refused to allow France to take military action or to impose any sanctions, even economic, against Germany, or to use Italy, against whom economic sanctions were still in force, in the field against Germany, as provided in the Locarno Pax. In a violent scene with Flandin on March 12th, Nivelle Chamberlain rejected sanctions and refused to accept Flandin's argument that, quote, 
If a firm front is maintained by France and England, Germany will yield without war. Close quote. Chamberlain's refusal to enforce the Locarno Pacts when they fell due was not his personal policy or anything new. It was the policy of the Conservative Party, and had been for years, as early as July 13, 1934. Sir Austin Chamberlain had stated publicly that Britain would not use troops to enforce the Rhineland clauses and would use its veto power in the Council of the League to prevent this by others under the Locarno Pacts. The remilitarization of the Rhineland also detached Belgium from the anti-German circle. Alarmed by the return of German troops to its border and by the failure of the British-Italian guarantee of Locarno, Belgium in October 1936 denounced its alliance with France and adopted a policy of strict neutrality. This made it impossible for France to extend its fortification system. The Maginot Line, which was being built on the French-German border, along the Belgian-German border. Moreover, since France was convinced that Belgium would be on its side in any future war with Germany, the line was not extended along the French-Belgian border either. It was across this unfortified border that Germany attacked France in 1940. Thus, Barthau's efforts to encircle Germany were largely, but not completely destroyed in the period 1934 to 1936, by four events. 1. The loss of Poland in January 1934. 2. The loss of Italy by January 1936. 3. The rearmament of Germany and the remilitarization of the Rhineland by March 1936. And 4. The loss of Belgium by October 1936. The chief items left in the Bartho system were the French and Soviet alliances with Czechoslovakia and with each other. In order to destroy these alliances, Britain and Germany sought, on parallel paths, to encircle France and the Soviet Union in order to dissuade France from honoring its alliances with either Czechoslovakia or the Soviet Union. To honor these alliances, France required two things as an absolute minimum. One that military cooperation against Germany be provided by Britain from the first moment of any French action against Germany, and, two, that France have military security on her non-German frontiers. Both of these essentials were destroyed by Britain in the period 1935 to 1936, and in consequence, France, finding itself encircled, dishonored its alliance with Czechoslovakia when it came due in September 1938. The encirclement of France had six items in it. The first was the British refusal from 1919 to 1939 to give France any promise of support against Germany in fulfillment of the French alliances with Eastern Europe or to engage in any military commitments in support of such alliances. On the contrary, Britain made it clear to France at all times, her opposition to these alliances, and that action under them was not covered by any promises Britain had made to support France against a German attack westward, or by any military discussions which arose from any Anglo-French efforts to resist such an attack. This distinction was the motivation of the Locarno Pacts and explains the refusal of Britain to engage in military conversations with France until the summer of 1938. The British attitude toward Eastern Europe was made perfectly clear on many occasions. For example, on July 13, 1934, Foreign Secretary Sir John Simon denounced Barthau's efforts to create an Eastern Locarno and demanded arms equality for Germany. The other five items in the encirclement of France were 1. The Anglo-German Naval Agreement of June 1935 2. The alienation of Italy over sanctions 3. The remilitarization of the Rhineland by Germany with British acquiescence and approval 4. The neutrality of Belgium and 5. 
the alienation of Spain. We have already discussed all these except the last, and have indicated the vital role which Britain played in all of them, except Belgium. Taken together, they changed the French military position so drastically that France, by 1938, found herself in a position where she could hardly accept to fulfill her military obligations to Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union. This was exactly the position in which the British government wished France to be, a fact made completely clear by the recently published secret documents. In May of 1935, France could have acted against Germany with all her forces because the Rhineland was unfortified and there was no need to worry about the Italian, Spanish, or Belgian frontiers or the Atlantic coastline. By the end of 1938, and even more by 1939, the Rhineland was protected by the new German fortified Siegfried Line. Parts of the French army had to be left on the unfriendly Italian and Spanish frontiers and along the lengthy neutral Belgian frontier. And the Atlantic coastline could not be protected against the new German fleet unless Britain cooperated with France. This need for British cooperation on the sea arose from two facts. A. The Anglo-German Naval Agreement of June 1935 allowed Germany to build a navy up to 35% of the British Navy, while France was restricted to 33% of Britain's strength in the chief categories of vessels, and B. The Italian occupation of the Balearic Islands, and parts of Spain itself, after the opening of the Spanish War in July 1936 required much of the French fleet to stay in the Mediterranean in order to keep open the transportation of troops and food from North Africa to metropolitan France. The details of the Spanish War will be discussed in the next chapter, but at this point it must be realized that the shift in the control of Spain from pro-French to anti-French hands was of vital importance to Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union as a factor in determining whether the French alliances with these two would be fulfilled when the German attack came. Parallel with the encirclement of France went the encirclement of the Soviet Union and, to a lesser extent, of Czechoslovakia. The encirclement of the Soviet Union was known as the anti comintern Pact. This was a union of Germany and Japan against communism and the Third International. It was signed in November 1936 and was joined by Italy a year later. Manchukuo and Hungary joined in February 1939, while Spain came in a month after that. The last countercircle was that against Czechoslovakia. Hungary on the Czechoslovak southern frontier and Germany on its northwestern frontier were both opposed to Czechoslovakia as an artificial creation of the Versailles Conference. The German annexation of Austria in March 1938 closed the gap in the anti-Czech circle on the west, while the aggressive designs of Poland after 1932 completed the circle everywhere except on the insignificant Romanian frontier in the extreme east. Although the Czechs offered the Poles a treaty and even a military alliance on three occasions, in 1932 to 1933, they were ignored, and the Polish-German agreement of January 1934 opened a campaign of vilification of Czechoslovakia by Poland, which continued parallel to the similar German campaign until the Polish invasion of Czechoslovakia in October 1938. Of these three countercircles to Barthau's efforts to encircle Germany, the most significant by far was the encirclement of France, which alone made the other two possible. In this encirclement of France, the most important factor, without which it could never have been achieved, was the encouragement of Britain. Accordingly, we must say a word about the motivations of Britain and the reactions of France. Any analysis of the motivations of Britain in 1938 through 1939 is bound to be difficult because different people had different motives, 
Motives changed in the course of time. The motives of the government were clearly not the same as the motives of the people. And in no country has secrecy and anonymity been carried so far or been so well preserved as in Britain. In general, motives become vaguer and less secret as we move our attention from the innermost circles of the government outward. As if we were looking at the layers of an onion, we may discern four points of view. 1. The anti-Bolsheviks at the center. 2. The three-block world supporters close to the center. 3. The supporters of appeasement. And 4. The peace-at-any-price group in the peripheral position. The anti-Bolsheviks, who were also anti-French, were extremely important from 1919 to 1926, but then decreased to little more than a lunatic fringe, rising again in numbers and influence after 1934, to dominate the real policy of the government in 1939. In the earlier period, the chief figures in this group were Lord Curzon, Lord Diabernon, and General Smuts. They did what they could to destroy reparations, permit German rearmament, and tear down what they called French militarism. This point of view was supported by the second group, which was known in those days as the Round Table Group, and came later to be called, somewhat inaccurately, the Cliveden Set, after the country estate of Lord and Lady Astor. It included Lord Milner, Leopold Amory, and Edward Grigg, Lord Altercham, as well as Lord Lothian, Smuts, Lord Astor, Lord Brand, brother-in-law of Lady Astor and managing director of Lazard Brothers, the international bankers, Lionel Curtis, Geoffrey Dawson, editor of The Times, and their associates. This group wielded great influence because it controlled the Rhodes Trust, the Bight Trust, the Times of London, the Observer, the influential and highly anonymous quarterly review, known as The Round Table, founded in 1910 with money supplied by Sir Abe Bailey and the Rhodes Trust, and with Lothian as editor. And it dominated the Royal Institute of International Affairs, called Chatham House, of which Sir Abe Bailey and the Astors were the chief financial supporters, while Lionel Curtis was the actual founder. The Carnegie United Kingdom Trust and All Souls College, Oxford. This roundtable group formed the core of the three-block world supporters and differed from the anti-Bolsheviks, like Diabernon, in that they sought to contain the Soviet Union between a German-dominated Europe and an English-speaking bloc, rather than to destroy it as the anti-Bolsheviks wanted. Relationships between the two groups were very close and friendly, and some people, like Smuts, were in both. The anti-Bolsheviks, including Diabernon, Smuts, Sir John Simon, and Herbert Albert Lawrence Fisher, warden of All Souls College, were willing to go to any extreme to tear down France and build up Germany. Their point of view can be found in many places, and most emphatically in a letter of August 11, 1920, from Diabernon to Sir Maurice, later Lord, Hankey a protege of Lord Escher, who wielded great influence in the interwar period as secretary to the cabinet and secretary to almost every international conference on reparations from Genoa, 1922, to Lausanne, 1932. Diabernon advocated a secret alliance of Britain with the German military leaders in cooperating against the Soviet as ambassador of Great Britain in Berlin in 1920-1926, Diabernon carried on this policy and blocked all efforts by the Disarmament Commission to disarm or even inspect Germany, according to Brigadier General John Hartman Morgan of the Commission. The point of view of this group was presented by General Smuts in a speech on October 23, 1923, made after luncheon with Herbert Albert Lawrence Fisher. From these two groups came the Dawes Plan and the Locarno Pacts. It was Smuts, according to Stressman, 
who first suggested the Locarno policy, and it was Diabernon who became its chief supporter. Herbert Albert Lauren Fisher and John Simon in the House of Commons, and Lothian, Dawson, and their friends on the Round Table, and on the Times, prepared the ground among the British governing class for both the Dawes Plan and Locarno as early as 1923. The Round Table for March 1923, the speeches of Fisher and Simon in the House of Commons on February 19, 1923, Fisher's speech on March 6, and Simon's speech on March 13, in the same place, the Round Table for June 1923, and Smut's speech of October 23rd. The more moderate Round Table group, including Lionel Curtis, Leopold Amory, who was the shadow of Lord Milner, Lord Lothian, Lord Brand, and Lord Astor, sought to weaken the League of Nations and destroy all possibility of collective security in order to strengthen Germany in respect to both France and the Soviet Union, and above all, to free Britain from Europe in order to build up an Atlantic bloc of Great Britain, the British Dominions, and the United States. They prepared the way for this union through the Rhodes Scholarship Organization, of which Lord Milner was the head in 1905 to 1925, and Lord Lothian was secretary in 1925 to 1940. Through the roundtable groups, which had been set up in the United States, India, and the British Dominions in 1910 to 1917, through the Chatham House Organization, which set up Royal Institutes of International Affairs in all the Dominions and a Council on Foreign Relations in New York, as well as through unofficial Commonwealth Relations Conferences held irregularly, and the Institutes of Pacific Relations set up in various countries as autonomous branches of the Royal Institutes of International Affairs. This influential group sought to change the League of Nations from an instrument of collective security to an international conference center for non-political matters like drug control or international postal services, to rebuild Germany as a buffer against the Soviet Union and a counterpoise to France, and to build up an Atlantic bloc of Britain, the Dominions, the United States, and, if possible, the Scandinavian countries. One of the effusions of this group was the project called Union Now, and later Union Now with Great Britain, propagated in the United States in 1938 to 1945 by Clarence Streit on behalf of Lord Lothian and the Rhodes Trust. Ultimately, the inner circle of this group arrived at the idea of the three-block world. It was believed that this system could force Germany to keep the peace after it absorbed Europe, because it would be squeezed between the Atlantic bloc and the Soviet Union, while the Soviet Union could be forced to keep the peace because it would be squeezed between Japan and Germany. This plan would work only if Germany and the Soviet Union could be brought into contact with each other by abandoning to Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and the Polish Corridor. This became the aim of both the anti-Bolsheviks and the three-block people from the early part of 1937 to the end of 1939, or even early 1940. These two cooperated and dominated the government in that period. They split in the period 1939 to 1940, with the three-block people like Amory, Lord Halifax, and Lord Lothian becoming increasingly anti-German while the anti-Bolshevik crowd like Chamberlain, Horace Wilson, and John Simon tried to adopt a policy based on a declared but unfought war against Germany combined with an undeclared fighting war against the Soviet Union. The split between these two groups appeared openly in public and led to Chamberlain's fall from office when Amory cried to Chamberlain across the floor of the House of Commons on May 10, 1940. Quote, in the name of God, go. Closed quote. Outside these two groups, and much more numerous, but much more remote from the real instruments of government, were the appeasers and the peace-at-any-price people. 
These were both used by the two inner groups to command public support for their quite different policies. Of the two, the appeasers were much more important than the peace-at-any-price people. The appeasers swallowed the steady propaganda, much of it emanating from Chatham House, the Times, the Round Table Groups, or Rhodes Circles, that the Germans had been deceived and brutally treated in 1919. For example, it was under pressure from seven persons, including General Smuts and Herbert Albert Lawrence Fisher, as well as Lord Milner himself, that Lloyd George made his belated demand on June 2, 1919, that the German reparations be reduced and the Rhineland occupation be cut from 15 years to two. The memorandum from which Lloyd George read these demands was apparently drawn up by Philip Kerr, Lord Lothian, while the minutes of the Council of Four, from which we get the record of those demands, were taken down by Sir Maurice Hankey as secretary to the Supreme Council, a position obtained through Lord Escher. It was Kerr, Lothian, who served as British member of the Committee of Five, which drew up the answer to the Germans' protest of May 1919. General Smuts was still refusing to sign the treaty because it was too severe as late as June 23, 1919. As a result of these attacks and the barrage of similar attacks on the treaty which continued year after year, British public opinion acquired a guilty conscience about the Treaty of Versailles and was quite unprepared to take any steps to enforce it by 1930. On this feeling, which owed so much to the British idea of sportsmanlike conduct toward a beaten opponent, was built the movement for appeasement. This movement had two basic assumptions. A. That reparation must be made for Britain's treatment of Germany in 1919. And B. That if Germany's most obvious demands, such as arms equality, remilitarization of the Rhineland, and perhaps union with Austria, were met, Germany would become satisfied and peaceful. The trouble with this argument was that once Germany reached this point, it would be very difficult to prevent Germany from going further, such as taking the Sudetenland and the Polish Corridor. Accordingly, many of the appeasers, when this point was reached in March 1938, went over to the anti-Bolshevik or three-block point of view, while some even went into the peace-at-any-price group. It is likely that Chamberlain, Sir John Simon, and Sir Samuel Hoare went by this road from appeasement to anti-Bolshevism. At any rate, few influential people were still in the appeasement group by 1939, in the sense that they believed that Germany could ever be satisfied. Once this was realized, it seemed to many that the only solution was to bring Germany into contact with, or even collision with, the Soviet Union. The peace-at-any-price people were both few and lacking in influence in Britain, while the contrary, as we shall see, was true in France. However, in the period August 1935 to March 1939, and especially in September 1938, the government built upon the fears of this group by steadily exaggerating Germany's armed might and belittling their own, by calculated indiscretions like the statement in September 1938 that there were no real anti-aircraft defenses in London, by constant hammering at the danger of an overwhelming air attack without warning, by building ostentatious and quite useless air raid trenches in the streets and parks of London, and by insisting through daily warnings that everyone must be fitted with a gas mask immediately, although the danger of a gas attack was nil. In this way, the government put London into a panic in 1938 for the first time since 1804, or even 1678. And by this panic, Chamberlain was able to get the British people to accept the destruction of Czechoslovakia, wrapping it up in a piece of paper marked Peace in Our Time, which he obtained from Hitler, as he confided to the ruthless dictator, for British public opinion. 
Once this panic passed, Chamberlain found it impossible to get the British public to follow his program, although he himself never wavered, even in 1940. He worked on the appeasement and the peace at any price groups throughout 1939, but their numbers dwindled rapidly, and since he could not openly appeal for support on either the anti-Bolshevik or the three-block bases, he had to adopt the dangerous expedient of pretending to resist in order to satisfy the British public while really continuing to make every possible concession to Hitler which would bring Germany to a common frontier with the Soviet Union, all the while putting every pressure on Poland to negotiate and on Germany to refrain from using force in order to gain time to wear Poland down and in order to avoid the necessity of backing up by action his pretense of resistance to Germany. This policy went completely astray in the period from August 1939 to April 1940. Chamberlain's motives were not bad ones. He wanted peace so that he could devote Britain's limited resources to social welfare, but he was narrow and totally ignorant of the realities of power. Convinced that international politics could be conducted in terms of secret deals, as business was, and he was quite ruthless in carrying out his aims, especially in his readiness to sacrifice non-English persons, who, in his eyes, did not count. In the meantime, both the people and the government were more demoralized in France than in England. The policy of the right, which would have used force against Germany, even in the face of British disapproval, ended in 1924, when Bartho, who had been one of the chief figures in the 1924 effort, tried to revive it in 1934. It was quite a different thing, and he had constantly to give at least verbal support to Britain's efforts to modify his encirclement of Germany into a four-power pact of Britain, France, Italy, Germany. This four-power pact, which was the ultimate goal of the anti-Bolshevik group in England, was really an effort to form a united front of Europe against the Soviet Union, and, in the eyes of this group, would have been a capstone to unite in one system the encirclement of France, which was the British answer to Barthou's encirclement of Germany, and the anti comintern pact, which was the German response to the same project. The Four Power Pact reached its fruition at the Munich Conference of September 1938, where these four powers destroyed Czechoslovakia without consulting Czechoslovakia's ally, the Soviet Union. But the scorn the dictators had for Britain and France as decadent democracies had by this time reached such a pass that the dictators no longer had even that minimum of respect without which the Four Power Pact could not function. As a consequence, Hitler in 1939 spurned all Chamberlain's frantic efforts to restore the Four Power Pact along with his equally frantic and even more secret efforts to win Hitler's attention by offers of colonies in Africa and economic support in Eastern Europe. As a result of the failure of the policy of the French right against Germany in 1924 and the failure of the policy of fulfillment of the French left in 1929 to 1930, France was left with no policy. Convinced that French security depended on British military and naval support in the field before action began, in order to avoid a German wartime occupation of the richest part of France, such as existed in 1914 to 1918, depressed by the growing unbalance of the German population over the French population, and shot through with pacifism and anti-war feeling, the French army, under Pitain's influence, adopted a purely defensive strategy and built up defensive tactics to support it. In spite of the agitations of Charles de Gaulle, then a colonel, and his parliamentary spokesman, Paul Renaud, to build up an armored striking force as an offensive weapon, France built a great and purely defensive fortified barrier from Montemedi to the Swiss frontier and retrained many of its tactical units into purely defensive duties within this barrier. 
It was clear to many that the defensive tactics of this Maginot line were inconsistent with France's obligations to her allies in Eastern Europe. But everyone was too paralyzed by domestic political partisanship, by British pressure from a purely Western European policy, and by general intellectual confusion and crisis wariness to do anything about bringing France's strategic plans and its political obligations into a consistent pattern. It was the purely defensive nature of these strategic plans, added to Chamberlain's veto on sanctions, which prevented Flandin from acting against Germany at the time of remilitarization of the Rhineland in March 1936. By 1938, and 1939, these influences had spread demoralization and panic into most parts of French society, with the result that the only feasible plan for France seemed to be to cooperate with Britain in a purely defensive policy in the West behind the Maginot Line, with a free hand for Hitler in the East. The steps which brought France to this destination are clear. They are marked by the Anglo-German Naval Agreement of June 1935, the Ethiopian Crisis of September 1935, the remilitarization of the Rhineland in March 1936, the neutralization of Belgium in 1936, the Spanish Civil War of 1936 to 1939, the destruction of Austria in March 1938, and the Czechoslovak Crisis leading up to Munich in September 1938. Along these steps, we must continue our story.